Uh, good evening. My name is Hooper Harris. Um, I'm a member of the CSA and the, uh, the Punch Train Yacht Club. A uh, little bit of introduction. I'm married to Victoria Ricky, who's on the uh, call tonight. And uh, we, uh, we sail a uh, Tiana 37 pilot house named Amity. Um, I've owned a few boats before that. Uh, I started sailing in a, a home-built uh, boat called the Turtle that my father made from plans that I think he got in mechanic, uh, Popular Mechanics magazine. Had a very short keel. Uh, going upwind involved getting out and waiting. Uh, it was that kind of a boat, but it was a lot of fun. And then, like most people, ended up with a sunfish for a while and then had a Columbia Contender and then 134 and now, now the Tiana. Um, we are going to be covering weather information sources for sailors. Last year, we had a program covering weather theory. We're going to cover a little bit of that as kind of a refresher and kind of get oriented a little bit before we start going into the, uh, the, the weather product types and working our way through that. Uh, and then we're going to go into the types of products and the communications methods used for, AV, uh, for, for marine weather uh, products. And then some examples from government services, which are for free. Well, actually you pay taxes, but nonetheless, uh, there's no additional cost involved. Uh, from the Marine Weather Center and from the Aviation Weather Center. You might say, well great, this is a sailing group. What's the deal with aviation weather? Well, they've got some really good weather products and it includes the surface where we are. So it, it's a pretty good set of uh, the robust products. And then we'll talk about some examples of commercial um, uh, sources of weather. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we take weather information and use it in decision making and, um, and work our way through that. Um, so with that, we'll just start with air masses. Now, basically speaking, we've got high pressure systems, low pressure systems. And the air is trying to go from the high pressure system to the low pressure system. And as the air moves, it is wind. So basically, whenever you're dealing with wind, you're dealing with the movement of air from a high pressure to a low pressure area. High pressure systems are mounds of air, literally mounds of air. Low pressure systems are depressions. That's why you hear about them being referred to as depressions. We talk about tropical depressions as a relatively strong low pressure system. Um, the air doesn't just flow directly from the center out or from the outside in, center out in the high or outside in in the low. Because the Earth is rotating, there's this thing called the Coriolis effect. And basically what that does is in the northern hemisphere, it deflects everything to the right. So what happens is the air falls out of the high pressure system, and as it does so, it's deflected to the right, and it creates a swirl, clockwise swirl of air leaving the high pressure system. Whereas in the low, we get a counterclockwise swirl of the air falling into the center of the low. The numbers you see are uh, numbers of millibars. It's a measurement of pressure. Um, the millibars uh, are connected on these lines called isobars, common uh, barometric pressure. So everybody on this line right here is at 1,008 millibars. The spacing of the uh, isobars tells us how fast the wind is going to be. The closer they are, the faster the wind. It's a higher pressure gradient over a shorter period of distance or a shorter distance, rather. The direction of the wind is predominantly driven in this air mass model by the Coriolis effect, by the swirling effect of highs and low pressure systems. So isobars that are close, lots of wind, far apart, not so much wind. The direction of the wind depends upon where you are in the circumference of a high or low pressure system. Now, as you can imagine, we've got the north and the south here in a high pressure system in, in the northern hemisphere. We typically would think the air is colder in the north than it is in the south, and sure enough, the cold air that's migrating down may actually start to impinge on the warmer air, and we call that a cold front. A front is simply a movement of air from a, a colder air or warmer air impinging on its opposite. Uh, in the case of a cold front, we have cold air moving underneath warm air. The cold air is dense, and consequently it has a very steep slope. As the cold air moves forward, it drives up the warm air, and as the warm air is driven up, it cools, and as it cools, water condenses out. Ultimately, ice condenses out, or the, the water uh, that, that is condensed uh, uh, solidifies into ice, and we create these tall vertical clouds, which we commonly call cumulus clouds, meaning heat. And if they have rain coming from them, we call them cumulonimbus clouds, and particularly cumulonimbus is associated with thunderstorms. Now it's a relatively steep front, and, and, and as it pushes forward, 
it causes the air to rise ahead of it. So you start seeing cumulus clouds early on uh, ahead of the front, several hundred miles ahead of the front. Those cumulus clouds start to grow and become stronger as you near the actual front itself where the heavy, heavy duty weather is. The symbol for a cold front is a uh, blue line with a set of triangles. The triangles point in the direction of the motion of the front. When a cold front is moving quickly, it can actually set up essentially a bow wave in front of the front. It's a very simplified explanation of it, but basically what we get is the, uh, uh, a secondary front, a localized front riding in front of the actual cold front, and it creates a row of heavy thunderstorms in front of the front. And those, these storms may actually move much faster than the front moves. These storms are called a squall line. And in a squall line, we have very strong thunderstorms that are in the leading edge, or ahead of the leading edge of the cold front, and they can actually accelerate and get to 40 to 50 knots ground speed. They can actually move with great speed uh, across the, uh, for example, crossing the entire Lake Pontchartrain in 30 minutes, for example. So a very dramatic uh, bit of weather. So if you think about it, a cold front is simply cold air squeezing under and pushing up warm air. A squall line is kind of like a cold front on steroids. It's basically a, uh, like I said, almost like a shock wave in front of the cold front. So the next type of front we want to look at is a warm front. Well, in this case, we've got warm air, and the warm air is sliding up over the colder, dense air. And because it's just sliding up, it's a much shallower slope. Now, a couple things happen out of this. Because the slope is shallower, there's less vertical development, and consequently, although we end up having rain, it's rain coming from stratus clouds, layered clouds, as opposed to the cumulus clouds, which are heat. The idea behind this is, is that you don't get the severity of the weather, but you get a lot more widespread weather. Uh, so, for example, in, in showing here just a couple of cities, you can actually have the cold, uh, the warm front rather, affecting the clouds all the way up until the time that you get the cirrus clouds, maybe six or 800 miles in front of the of warm front. Um, warm fronts are classically uh, considered much more benign than cold fronts. They do create widespread rain, widespread low visibilities, but not necessarily any uh, significant uh, thunderstorm sort of activity. The warm front symbol is a red line because it's warm and it has a set of scallops and again the scallops point in the direction that the front is moving. So there is another possibility, Let's see here, oh, here we go, Let's see if we can, yep there we go. In this case we have a cold front that is overtaking a warm front and this is called an occluded front or an occlusion. An occluded front is a mixture of both our, our uh, uh, cold front uh, cumulonimbus and the warm front extended range long area of, of, of poor weather. Um, so uh, occlusions occur typically near the, uh, the, the source of fronts in the center of a low where literally a cold front overcomes or over, um, overtakes a warm front. Uh, and again, it's a combination of the two. The symbol for an occluded front is this purple combination of both triangles and uh, scallops. And then finally, we have the stationary front, which is a front which is not moving. A classic example in southern Louisiana is a cold front coming through in um, early summertime, where we end up having some cold air coming in from the north, but in reality, it's not that cold. It's not a strong cold front. And that front comes through and it gets out into the, uh, uh, crosses over the shoreline and into the Gulf where it starts to meet some, some fairly significantly warm air over the water. And when that happens, the front just kind of goes, Egh. it just can't go any further. We get a stationary front at that point. Sometimes the warm air is actually strong enough that it's able to actually push the front back. And the front comes down as a cold front becomes stationary and then backs up as a warm front. And in that case, we end up having weather uh, for prolonged periods of time, many days over the uh, New Orleans and uh, southern Louisiana area. Um, and that's the basic uh, 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 discussion of fronts Hoover. and the symbology. Yes, sir. Isn't the weather that we had this past weekend exactly what you're talking about? Yes. There was a uh, cold front uh, north of Lake Pontchartrain on Saturday 
it was a very weak cold front, and as it came through, it created some weather. There was some rain in the middle of the night. Um, there was some wind. I actually got up to see what the wind was just because I've got new wind instruments on my boat. I wanted to kind of see if they work. And sure enough, uh, the wind never got above about 12 knots. It wasn't terribly strong. Um, but there was a wind shift, and the wind did change, and there was a little bit of a temperature shift. And then that front went south and got stuck just offshore. It became a stationary front, and I haven't looked at it today, but it's either broken up or it's actually uh, still a stationary front. Still I can't even imagine that it continues to go. There's just not enough energy in that cold front. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, and by the way, if anybody else has a question or comment, feel free to jump in. Um, the next item we're going to talk about is the symbology that we see in wind uh, indications uh, on, uh, on, on some of the products. Calm winds are shown by a circle. Uh, the barb that is used on the symbol points toward the source of wind. And I have to tell you, I believe that to be counterintuitive. Yes. These things look like arrows. And, you know, the, 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 the fletching on the back of the arrow is, it stays at the back, right? That's the whole idea. Uh, but in reality, the way this works is the barb points toward the wind. And the barbs indicate, the barb lines indicate the strength of the wind. Half lines indicate five knots, full lines indicate ten, and then if you have a pennant, you've reached fifty knots. Uh, so we have some examples of that, just to kind of remind ourselves. This is northeast at five knots. This is southeast at fifteen. And that's southwest at sixty-five knots. So we can interpret those uh, particular uh, uh, symbols. The next thing is uh, we've talked about air masses in terms of high pressure systems, low pressure systems, fronts. Those are, are big area, regional sorts of weather phenomena. What we run into, though, particularly in a place like Lake Pontchartrain, is uh, local meteorology related to land and sea breezes. So basically, what happens is during the day, the, the ground, the earth, heats up. And as it heats up, as we talked about last, last, uh, some, uh, last uh, uh, year in the, in the seminar, the earth it absorbs heat rapidly and releases it very rapidly. And when it does that, it heats the air and the air rises over the land. Now, as it rises, the other, I mean, you can't, nature abhors a vacuum, it's one of those great uh, concepts of physics, is that sure enough, something's got to go and take its place. And what happens is, air that is over the water is drawn onto the land. Now that's relatively cold air that comes onto the land and it of course is heated and it rises. Well, what happens to the air that rises? It just doesn't disappear. Well, there's air that's coming in off the water. It has to go and fill it back up. So this is a circulation pattern that we see during the day. The, the water receives heat, absorbs heat as well, but it absorbs it very slowly and it releases it very slowly compared to land. So the land is, uh, is quite the uh, marketplace for heat transfer. It absorbs it and gets rid of it quickly. The water absorbs it, holds on to it, releases it slowly. And what ends up happening is, is during the day, we end up having a phenomenon near shorelines, and I'm saying within a few miles of the shore, in which we get winds blowing onto the shore, called a sea breeze. We know that sitting out here uh, on the veranda outside this, uh, uh, th this yacht club. Uh, we can sit out there and it can be fairly warm outside, and yet because we're in the shade, of course, but we're also getting a breeze coming in off the lake. And that lake breeze is cooler air, and it comes in and it makes it very comfortable to sit out here even though it's swelteringly hot otherwise. So at night, things change. At night, the water, which has been receiving heat all day long but not releasing it, Okay, it's sitting out there and it starts releasing its heat, whereas the ground has absorbed heat and released it quickly, it becomes fairly cool. And the exact opposite process occurs in this case. In this case, the warm air rises over the water. As it rises, the cooler air from land goes toward the water, and the warmer air that has risen actually has to fall back down in the circulatory pattern. Now, this would be great as a discussion if we we're just talking about being on a shoreline. But we're at a lake. Yes, ma'am? Um, I don't know if it's used by the terms an offshore wind or an onshore wind. So is, 
Is it or it's blowing offshore or it's well, blowing onshore? Okay, so if the wind is coming from uh, uh, coming onshore, it means that the wind is coming from the water to the land. Okay. An offshore wind, the land is going or the water the wind is going from the land onto the water. That would be logical. So yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So this is what a lake breeze looks like. And this is a, a pretty interesting phenomenon here in Lake, in, in lake Munchtrain. In this case, we have warm land during the day, heating and rising air. And as that, line, that, that air rises, it forms a set of cumulus clouds. Well, the air rises. And as it rises, cool air is pulled in off the water. And that water is, or that air rather, is drawn onto land to, to feed the circulation. And of course, that circulation comes back down to the center of the lake, except that instead of simply being a single shoreline, it's the entire circumference of the lake. So we have the air going up on the circumference of the lake and falling down in the center of the lake. And that circulatory pattern drives the wind along the shoreline. Now, if there is a strong air mass wind, in other words, we have a high pressure system or a low pressure system with a lot of sustained wind, this gets broken up and becomes less uh, obvious. If, the, if there is very little in the way of air mass wind, this circulatory system will really set up. Now, one thing I want to offer on this is, if you had, for example, a wind, and we'll just say for convention that that is the west, if we have a wind blowing from the west fairly strongly, what we'll see is, this side will experience a higher wind because we're getting both a combination of the, the air mass wind as well as the lake breeze effect. This side will get less wind because we have wind coming from the air mass, but it's being counteracted by the lake effect. So you'll see a difference in wind velocity on the two sides of the lake, the upwind or the downwind side of the lake, depending upon how strong the, uh, uh, the, uh, the flow is. Now, going back to our discussion that you mentioned about uh, the weather on Saturday, uh, I'm going to show you a, a track of my boat on Saturday going from Mandeville to New Orleans. And I'm going to start by telling you, this is not how you ought to sail the boat if you're in a race, okay? But it's an interesting demonstration of how the lake effect is real. It's not just something on paper. It's not just something made up. This is... Uh, uh, a screenshot taken from the Navionics um, app on my phone. And you'll see a yellow line here, and it curves around, and there, it ends here. That's because, stupidly, I stopped recording the uh, track. And I, I extended the line myself to show where we went, and I have a crossing line and a dash line. That crossing line and the dash line is when we started to motor into New Orleans Yacht Club Harbor. Now, why did we do that? We did that because by the time we got here, the winds reported at the uh, New Basin Canal uh, station, which is right next to Southern Yacht Club, were out of the north-northwest at two knots. So it clearly wasn't like we're going to be making head, great headway uh, into the lake um, or into the Yacht Club. Now here's the interesting thing about this. That's one tack. One single tack for the entire trip. It was a, it was a starboard tack with about a, uh, it averaged around 40 degrees. It was anywhere between 35 to 45, maybe 50 degree angle. Anytime it got up to 60, we, we re-steered the boat. Anytime it started to, uh, you know, started to pinch up too tight, we would we'd fall off a little bit. We kept the, 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 um, the apparent wind right at about 40 degrees. We trimmed the sails and we rode it. What happened was, We experienced relative winds, apparent wind angles, shown in these light arrows, all running about 40 degrees off to starboard. And yet, the heading of the boat changed over 90 degrees. How did that happen? If you take the path of the boat and its speed and factor that into the apparent wind, this is what you get in terms of true wind. The true wind on this trip was from the center of the lake to the shoreline. We didn't plan to do this. We got out here, we got out here late. Uh, we were the last boat out of the slip to make our way out. 
my good friend Joe Brantley was going to do some videotaping of us with a drone, so we did some figure eights out in front of the, uh, the, the jetty out here. That made us even further away. We went ahead and struck out on our first tack. Early on, one of my crew members said, oh, no, we've got to tack over toward the, uh, toward the, uh, the causeway. So I, I'm, a, I'm a nice guy. That sounds like a good idea. So I did that. And at that point, we weren't making any headway toward uh, the yacht club. So I went ahead and went back to 165 degrees heading and said, hang on, that's just about 20 or 30 degrees off where we really want to be. It's not so bad. Let's go out here and see what happens. What happened was we were able to hold a constant apparent wind while we turned the boat. And basically, this is not unlike the idea of if you were going to try to cross the Atlantic, you might have to go north or south a significant amount to get to the wind pattern that will actually take you to where you want to go. It is the same mental model. It's not, by the way, again, I'm never, not going to argue that this is a great way to race a boat or even a great way to cruise it. But for somebody who likes weather, this was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun to let the weather take me to New Orleans. It's a really cool way to do business. Again, I don't know that I do it again, but it's proof that this lake effect concept is real. So let's now talk about weather products, uh, the sources of weather information. So basically, there are two different product types, reports and forecasts. Reports are current conditions or observations, as they're sometimes referred to. So these can be automated, as uh, many we, we see automated weather reports at airports all over the country. We see automated reports on buoys. Um, they can be human observations. They can be observations from aircraft and observations from vessels. So there are lots of ways that you can get observations. One could argue satellite photography and, and radar are also forms of observations, and they are. They're just not being done by a human. Uh, they may have to be uh, interpreted by a human, but, but basically they're being done remotely. Forecasts, on the other hand, are expected conditions in the future. So a couple of things about forecasts. The further out that there is a forecast, the less accurate it will be, the less reliable it will be. A forecast for three hours from now, probably pretty good. Forecast for 10 days from now, yeah, don't, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that tracks out during the, during the rest of the week. The further out, the less accurate. Forecasts are based on different various models. So what are we talking about? So there's a model used by uh, weather service organizations uh, that takes a look at the atmosphere and it says, if this happens, we expect this to happen. If this is present, this will happen. It's a set of algorithms related to temperature and humidity and pressure and wind and the, the terrain involved, whether it's urban terrain or forest or whether it's uh, 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 over water. Uh, it takes a look at water temperature, obviously. It takes a look at cloud cover from satellites. It takes a look at a whole bunch of data. And, and, and all these models are adjusted slightly by different um, uh, uh, organizations that create them. And, and what's interesting is, is that if you just looked a few days or a few hours, rather, ahead, almost every reliable mainline weather model, meteorological model, is accurate and is right on top of each other. Think about the splay of what is called the spaghetti uh, pattern that we think of in hurricane forecasting. Well, if you're just looking at the base of it, the lines are all on top of each other for about the first six hours or so, and then they start to widen up. Sure enough, about three or four days later, one of them's going to Cuba and the other one's going to Mexico. And, and the answer is, is that, again, the further out, there's less accuracy, but also when you have different models, there's less consistency between them. Typically, weather forecasters are better at predicting bad weather than good. Now, why is that? That's because weather forecasting is a public safety utility. We want to know when there are going to be tornadoes. We want to know when there are going to be hurricanes. We want to know when there are going to be sandstorms. We want to know when there's going to be flooding. Okay? All the stuff that's in the Bible that says that the world's coming to an end, we'd like to know about that. Okay? So consequently, the National Weather Service was one of the early government agencies put together from a public safety standpoint. Now, we turn around and use their data quite often to figure out things like whether or not we're going to have a picnic one afternoon or whether we're going to go sailing or whatever we're going to be doing. 
but characteristically, weather forecasters and the models that they use tend to uh, lend themselves to predicting poor weather better than they predict good weather. Even if, and I got this from uh, Minette Burns, even if the forecast is for fairly good weather, think about like the value added tax in the UK. It's just something that gets chap uh, put on uh, a little bit of land yet. If the weather is predicted to be good, give yourself a moment to think about, but what if they're wrong and it's worse? Or if you're marginal, if you think, well, the weather is pretty close to my limit, my personal limit as a sailor, or the limit for my boat, or maybe the limit for my passengers and crew, then you need to start thinking, well, what if it was a little bit worse? What would you do then? And start getting into this decision-making process as opposed to simply looking at the weather and saying, oh, it said it was going to be okay. Uh, that, that's not good enough in the decision-making process. You have to look at it and take that forecast as a bit of data, as a, as a data point. And then from your own perspective, figure out if you really want to rely on it. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, uh, my argument is you want to keep looking at the weather to, to continuously uh, update yourself. So in terms of uh, product transmission, weather product transmission, there are three basic methods. There's voice, and of course we do that on radio. There are text products, and uh, we do these, uh, uh, we can do them by the internet, obviously, and graphical pro uh, products. Each have their place. The graphical products are the most easily manipulated and, uh, and, and customizable, and, and, and actually for most people, they're much more intuitive. Uh, the text products, you have to read all the way through it. The voice products, uh, you have to be listening to it at the right time in many cases. What's interesting to me, at least, <laughs> is weather information uh, using voice has been around about as long as there's been radio telephony, radio telephone operations. Uh, the shipping forecast in the United Kingdom uh, has been broadcast continuously with the exception of the Second World War since 1924. Basically what they do, and, and I'm only offering this not because we're going to sail there, but it kind of sets the tone for how we do voice weather information. They took the entire area around the British Isles, gave them a bunch of names, and then start at 12 o'clock and work their way around. As they work their way around in this voice broadcast, they have a litany of things that they have to say. They have to tell you what the, uh, what the conditions are, and they use very basic terms, fair, good, Poor. And so you might hear 40s is one of the areas right here. 40s. Fair, occasionally good, often poor. I mean, you'll literally use words like that to kind of give you a sense of what's going on. Uh, they'll go through the C state using the, uh, the, uh, the C state uh, scale. Um, and then they'll also go through any kind of observations about thunderstorms or gales or, or uh, 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 hail or anything like that. Anyway, it takes it about uh, 20 minutes to go all the way around this. Now, what's interesting about this to me is, is that nobody uses this to, to, for, for weather information for shipping anymore because we now have internets and, and uh, internet access and we have uh, 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 visuals, uh, graphics, and so on. What keeps this broadcast continuing is that a significant number of people in the UK go to sleep listening to it because it's the most god-awful, boring <laughs> thing you can imagine. And I personally have listened to this, and it is like a lullaby uh, to go to sleep to. And, and I have the link to the British uh, uh, BBC shipping forecast uh, uh, on BBC4 at the end of the presentation. And I really encourage, if you want some interesting white noise, this is a good place to go. But this just gives you an idea of how long people have been doing this. So what do we do here in the United States? Well, we have the NOAA Weather Radar, or Weather Radio, or the National Weather Service Weather Broadcast. There are seven frequencies. It's utilized as a VHF line of sight uh, communication method. Uh, it includes both civil as well as maritime information. It has forecasts, observations, and there's a sequence that is followed. So they go through a specific sequence of what reports are gonna be given. The downside of this is if you just missed the Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Maurepas forecast, you got to wait for the rest of it. So you got to find out what high tide is going to be like at Chalmette before we get to there, okay? So you're going to go through a lot of other weather information before you get there. The surface area that is shown here in the light green is what is called the, um, the surface volume of the uh, broadcast. 
and that's based on the receiver being at ground level. So the transmitter's on a tower, they, are in, they end up getting about a 50 mile radius uh, out of this. If you have an antenna that is on a mast on your boat, you will get better service volume than this uh, demonstrates. Um, is this system uh, usable? Absolutely, but again, there's some cha uh, challenges in that you, you have to turn it on and often wait through a long bunch of weather you weren't interested in to get to the little nugget that you were interested in. And even then, you'll only hear a couple of sentences being spoken about it. And if you missed it, you got to wait for the rest of it again. Do they have a chart that tells you which channel services what areas? So in fact, you can go to the National Weather Service uh, uh, site, and uh, that's where I got this diagram, for example, for uh, KHB 43, the station in New Orleans, and you can actually see each of the uh, facilities around the uh, country. Unfortunately, the National Weather Service will only tell you what the frequency is in megahertz. They say that WX1 and WX2 are uh, uh, essentially numbers chosen by radio manufacturers, and there's no requirement that they be the same between manufacturers. However, it appears most have settled on the table that I've shown there. So the answer to that is, um, yes, you can find uh, these stations all over the United States. They do publish the service volume for each one of their stations, and um, uh, you can correlate that to a channel number if you use this little table that's attached to the handout. Text weather products um, are, the, are the source for information that is done in the voice transmissions. These people aren't just making up the information, they're reading the text product into uh, the radio, or actually they're doing it with uh, synthetic voices now. Um, the text weather products include observations for the various stations here in, the, in, in, in Lake Pontchartrain, and you'll see things like uh, wind, sometimes there will be an air temperature and a dew point, water temperature, water level, barometric pressure, and the precipitation for the last one hour. Uh, some stations do not create all of the, that data, it only creates part of that data, and so it will be missing in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the printout. Also, of course, we have forecasts. So we have a, a forecast on the right-hand side. Uh, this is a coastal waters forecast for Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Maurepas, and we've all seen these. We've also heard them on the radio. Uh, rest of the day, tonight, Sunday, Sunday night, and so on. And these, are, again, are one or two sentences to describe the weather that's going to happen. It, the advantage of this is it's low bandwidth required. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple uh, uh, bit of text. You can get it pretty easily. It can be emailed quite easily. Um, and and, the, and it's, it's easily read. The challenge is there's not a lot of data there. There's, there's just a general understanding of what the weather is going to be. You don't get, well, what about at 9 o'clock in the morning, where's the wind going to be? Where's the wind going to be at 1030? Where, where's the wind going to be, you know, you don't get that kind of information. Text messages also include marine warnings and advisories. One of them is the small craft advisory. It used to be called the small craft warning. It's an advisory issued on coastal and nearshore marine forecasts. Now, the thresholds for what an FCA or a small craft advisory are uh, is, is issued, the, 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 the threshold governing the issue, issuance are specific to geographic regions. They vary. We actually, I did some research and found out what it is for Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, it can be issued in the case of sea or lake ice that exists that could be hazardous to small boats. I guess that means too many people have dropped their drink into Lake Pontchartrain because otherwise I don't know that we're going to get a lot of ice. Mm -hmm. There is no precise definition of a small craft. However, there is some apocryphal data, you might say, some stuff that's floating around that says this is all designed around a 24-foot boat. Anything 24 feet or smaller is a small craft, and I would say that's, that's not an unreasonable um, uh, statement. But any vessel could be adversely affected by a small craft advisory, uh, and, and any one vessel that is affected should consider itself a small craft. So what kind of vessels might be affected by a small craft advisory that might be much bigger than 24 feet? Um, in, the, in the Chesapeake Bay, they have these things called bay-built uh, fishing boats, very low freeboard, uh, uh, essentially flat bottom with a small keel. These boats can't ride out much in the way of sea state, and they also can't ride out a whole bunch of wave action 
over the uh, over the side uh, without uh, without getting some water in the boat. So um, you might actually look at a boat like that that might be 30 or 5 or 40 feet long and say, you know, a small craft advisory might be a pretty big deal. On the other hand, uh, a 24-foot uh, 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 keel boat uh, with, uh, you know, with a lot of ballast involved might be uh, much more safe to operate uh, than perhaps a bay-built boat in, in rougher weather on, 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 uh, on the lake. Um, there are other considerations. Obviously, the experience of the operator uh, the type, the overall size, and finally the seaworthiness of the vessel, depending upon its condition. So if you have a, a large vessel in poor condition with a minimally qualified crew, probably a small craft advisory is something you need to pay a lot of attention to, which you might not have thought to otherwise. Small craft advisory thresholds for our area, for the southern part of the United States, you know, sustained winds 20 to 33 knots, why 33? Because if it goes to 34, it becomes a uh, gale warning. Um, so a small craft advisory is 20 to 33 knots and or forecast seas seven feet or greater that are expected to last for more than two hours. So a couple things happen here. Basically on Lake Pontchartrain, for a small craft advisory to be issued, the wind is going to be between 20 and 33 knots and it's going to last for more than two hours. Okay, that's the answer. Is it going to be sea state above seven feet? If you've got a seven foot sea state on Lake Punch Train, you're not, you're not getting a small craft advisor because you're looking at a gale or a hurricane advisor. Okay? So, uh, would that be true offshore? Yeah, it might be possible to get seven feet offshore without uh, significant wind. But for us in Lake Punch Train, this pretty much uh, covers it right here. And, and notice that it's for more than two hours, so a short term weather phenomena like a, a squall line, for example, coming through and exposing an area for high, uh, bad weather for a short period of time, less than two hours, that's not going to make a small craft advisory. That will become a marine weather advisory. A special marine warning, excuse me, a special marine warning, uh, not, a, uh, not a, a marine weather advisory. A special marine warning is a warning of potential hazardous weather conditions, usually of short duration. This is where we capture thunderstorms and squall lines. This is where we say, look, it's not going to be for more than two hours in Lake Punch Train. This is going to be over with in 35 or 45 minutes or an hour. But it's going to be severe, and if it had been longer, we probably would issue a small craft advisory. So what are we looking at? Sustained maritime uh, or marine thunderstorm winds or associated guts of 34 knots or greater. Well, wait a minute, shouldn't that have made a, made a gale warning? Yeah. Except for the duration, less than two hours. Less than two hours falls under this method. Hail, three quarters of an inch or more in diameter, or water spouts. These are the things that trigger a special marine warning. Affected areas are not adequately covered by existing marine warnings. So if there's a hurricane warning, or a gale warning, tropical storm warning, yeah, you may have sustained winds over 34. You may have hail. You may have water spouts, but you're not getting a special marine warning. It's already covered in the hurricane warning or the tropical uh, storm warning. Also, there's some short duration events, things like strong cold fronts, squall lines, and so on, lasting two hours or less and producing winds of gusts of 34 knots or greater. This is just a copy from the, uh, uh, from the National Weather Service page. It's a little bit re repetitive. The key is this type of, re this type of warning is for something fairly localized, fairly quick moving, and stronger than 34 knots, possibility of water spouts, obviously the possibility of hail. So here's some examples. This is a small craft advisory for Sebastian Inlet to Jupiter Inlet on the uh, east coast of Florida. And, and basically what you can see here is we end up with higher winds and seas going pretty high up to nine feet, uh, the dominant period seven seconds, fair amount of information here. Because, again, there's a small craft advisory in effect, and there's a substantial amount of information there to help us understand the severity of it. Over the other side is a special uh, marine warning. And this is for, um, if I remember correctly, let me take a look here. I believe it's for um, you know, Boothville to Southwest Pass. And it's related to a strong thunderstorm located near Southwest Pass and Mississippi River, River, Mississippi River moving east at 25 knots. The hazard or wind gusts 34 knots or greater, and the source is by radar. This, this isn't based on a report from, from a mariner. This is looking at radar. They see the severe storm. 
they assess the wind might be above 34 knots. They expect that to last for less than two hours at any one location. And consequently, they issue a special marine warning. And there's some in, in, important information here. Things like uh, move to safe harbor immediately as gusty winds and high waves are expected. Frequent lightning is occurring if caught in the open water. Stay below deck as possible and keep away from ungrounded metal objects. So this is getting right with the program here. There's a discussion here, expect winds in excess of 35 knots and suddenly higher waves. Boats could sustain damage or capsize. Make sure all on board are wearing life jackets. Return to safe harbor if possible. This is pretty serious and it's short term um, uh, high hazard weather environment. So how do they push that warning out? They do this on the uh, voice, uh, on, on, the, on the weather channel and on, on uh, 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 NOAA weather radio. Uh, so it will be included in that report uh, on, on the on NOAA weather radio. The Coast Guard also mm -hmm. will uh, alert that there is a, um, uh, a special um, a, a, a special weather um, statement, uh, and they will put that out on Channel 16 and direct you to Channel 22, mm -hmm. where they'll read it to you. So it's so if you're on the, any, you should have a weather radio on at all times. Your if, if, if you're in an area where there's a potential where there's a, a front coming through or the potential for a squall line it would be worthwhile to to monitor channel 16 certainly because the Coast Guard will advise when a, uh, a special weather uh, warning has been issued as a marine warning has been issued and then will direct you to go to typically channel 22 to hear it so they get you off of channel 16 so they don't you know, block it up obviously cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about graphical products. We're going to talk about them in two flavors, and, and the two flavors are government products and, 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 and commercial products. We're going to start with government products. Oddly enough, the National Weather Service Marine Weather Center has very little in the way of graphical uh, material. Most of it is text-oriented material. The graphical weather products are heavily loaded up on the Aviation Weather Center, and, and that's on one of the... Uh, uh, one of the websites in your handout uh, that you can go to. Um, the charts that I'm going to talk about here are the surface analysis chart, the surface prognostic chart, or prog chart as it's called, and something called the graphical area forecast or the GFA. And we're going to talk a little bit about the filters that you can use to figure out what you want to look at because this allows you to look at weather in different perspectives. The presence of thunderstorms, ceiling and visibility, which is big for pilots, not so much for uh, or for mariners, except for visibility when it gets low, the precipitation, uh, wind, uh, and, um, uh, and and that information is all available uh, in in the area forecast, the graphical area forecast. So this is what a surface prognostic chart or prog chart looks like. It is basically the highs and low pressure systems in the United States and the associated fronts. And in this case, you can see there's a large high pressure system the southeast part of the United States. This was early on in May, and our weather was actually outrageously good all across the southeast part of the United States, with some nasty mm -hmm. stuff going on back in the upper uh, uh, in the upper plains and, uh, and a, and a uh, significant front running up into Canada. Now, this information is good from kind of an overall perspective of what you're looking at. But again, this is the surface analysis chart. It's the current weather. It is the current high pressure, low pressure systems and front locations. It does not contain precipitation information. You could go to current radar, for example, and get that information. Once we start looking in the future and going into the prog charts themselves, even though this is under the heading of surface prog chart, it is the analysis chart. It's for the current time. So imagine that the prog charts are a series of charts available to you online starting with now and going forward for 48 hours. So what we do is, is we can take a look at a prog chart and it looks similar. It has the fronts uh, and, and there's some, some highs and lows reference there, but there's also precipitation and there's a scale that goes along with this chart that you can look at to see what the color indicates in terms of the kind of precipitation. Is it rain? Is it snow? Is it hail? Is it ice pellets? Uh, and what the rate of that accumulation is. So this gives you a good visual image of what's going on with the weather. Now, you can get to 
uh, of right, I'm going to do this without knocking over any of the wires, you can come over here and adjust the time. So you can set the time uh, at six hour intervals and get a, an image movement of the, uh, of the weather. Now that's great, you can click on it and set the time for six hours ahead and you'll get a new image and you'll have to remember what the previous one was and after you do that two or three times you're kind of having a hard time keeping track of what's moved where. So consequently they have this thing called thumbs, thumbnails up here. Yes sir. So the dashes, I meant to ask on the last one, but you got some on that one. What about the, the low and the middle? Yeah, the so the, these are these are troughs. Troughs. Right. All right, the dash lines, uh, not related to front lines, indicate troughs or ridges. A trough is an elongated low-pressure system. A ridge is an elongated high-pressure system. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. This is what the thumbnails look like. Now, when you pull this up, you get a thumbnail for, I think, seven days at six hours a pop. And what ends up happening is you have the surface analysis that's at 1800 UTC on the 6th of May, and at, uh, at, at four zeros uh, UTC, midnight, on the morning of the 7th. Here's our prog chart with the surface uh, uh, location of fronts and our precipitation. And here we see it another six hours and another six hours after that. And we can compare those and start to see the movement of weather. So why is that important? Because if you're sitting there on, on Monday evening thinking about going on a race or a cruise on Saturday, and you're looking at the weather and you're saying, well, this is what the weather's supposed to be, you can get a sense of how it's supposed to track during the week. And then come back and take a look at it tomorrow night and see how it worked out. Are the fronts moving faster? Is the rain more widespread? Uh, are we seeing the isobars tighten up and the winds picking up, or are we seeing them spread apart? You can do your own analysis of how the forecast is working out. And as that forecast evolves, it is re-updated continuously. So again, short order forecasts are going to remain accurate, and further out, the more spread out those forecasts are going to be. So as we approach Saturday morning, you're going to start to be really in sync with what's going on with the weather. You'll know what's happening. Now that's important because ultimately you're going to be looking out at the weather with your own eyeball and knowing something about where did this come from and where is it going and what is it supposed to be doing starts making it make sense and once it starts making sense you can make better decisions about weather as opposed to simply reading the report and thinking oh, I don't know what do you think you know you, you get to a, a better understanding of the weather by, by being able to track this now you can also go on the aviation weather site and go to the graphical forecast for aviation, the GFA. The graphical forecast for aviation have a series of, of pull down or, 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 or buttons up here. Here's the button that's been pressed is for winds and we've chosen surface because that's where we are, right? We're on a boat. We're not up at 42,000 feet in an airplane. We're at the surface. Sure enough, you can bring up the winds and you can run your slider across and see these winds change. You can see the barbs change direction and the number of um, feathers on the barb, for want of a better term, changes the wind velocity changes. And you can get this from other sources. This one's free, kind of cool. So the idea behind this is it allows you to get access to the wind information. And if you wanted to, you could go and take a look at the presence of thunderstorms or other precipitation. If you wanted to worry about the visibility, you could go over here and select ceiling and visibility and get an indication of what the visibility would be. Again, being able to slide your uh, your time slider across left and right to uh, pick it up. Yes, sir. Is that web only or is that app? It's uh, it's web only, but I've accessed it on my phone. Uh, you know, just as a, you know, accessing a website. Uh, it's not an app. It is uh, it's web only. So this is the precipitation and weather uh, button having been pushed. And basically it changes what we are looking at. It changes the, 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 the code or the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the legend for what the map is showing. So this is showing precipitation in this, in this green area and the precipitation type are thunderstorms. This is a symbol for a, a thunderstorm. But there's this big, you know, odd looking polygon out here that actually is a thunderstorm, severe thunderstorm warning area. Now, how come there are no thunderstorms up here? 
because that warning is issued for a period of several hours. These thunderstorms are going to be moving up and filling up that area, moving across. All that says is that somewhere in that, that uh, polygon, there's going to be a severe thunderstorm. And it may happen at the beginning of the, uh, the period for the, uh, thunder, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, thunderstorm warning. It may be at the end of the period of the thunderstorm warning. What this does is it shows, again, with a time slider, where the expectation is for the thunderstorms to be and the expectation for precipitation. What are those little arrows with the hats on them? That okay, are that's actually a thunderstorm symbol. So, so, so it's a towering you know, cumulus cloud okay. with lightning coming out of it. And so they put them in a row saying, we expect thunderstorms to be in, in, this, in, that, in that area. In that area. Yeah, and it's just a grid of, of, of them. Oh, okay. I wouldn't say there's a thunderstorm there. There's not one there. This is the area where there's going to be thunderstorms at that time. So the polygon is the warning. The this polygon is the warning. And, and as you move the slider left and right for time, uh, you're going to see these storms move and give you a sense of where they're going. This is the um, precipitation and weather, uh, which ultimately uh, gives us a sense of rain uh, and also the potential uh, for fog. So in this case, we have rain shown in green, and that rain includes thunderstorms. We don't always have thunderstorms when it rains. When we have thunderstorms, it, however, it is always raining. So um, you have that kind of concept. But look over here in Mobile Bay and in the Associated Basin. You end up seeing a wide area of low visibility in the form of fog, the yellow. And this is the symbol for fog. These three lines uh, parallel like that is the symbol for fog. And that fog works its way across uh, Mobile Bay area all the way on over into um, Santa Rosa and uh, uh, over, over toward Pensacola and over toward Santa Rosa. So uh, it's, it's widespread, and it's widespread up into the, uh, into the basin in this particular example. So those are government products. And again, the Aviation Weather Center, I think, is probably the best source of government graphic weather uh, information, graphical weather information. What about commercial sources? Well, the commercial sources that we see being advertised and, uh, and, 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 and uh, subscription services and for fee services classically are based on government observation data because the government takes observations all over and the data is public, okay? So there's no reason for a commercial enterprise to go get its own observations. That'd be, that'd be crazy. But it's augmented by commercial sources such as commercial and amateur weather stations, TV uh, weather radar, uh, Doppler radar included, and aircraft and vessel automated observations that might be uh, for, for, for fee, where, where a uh, vendor is paying for that. The commercial products have a wider range of models which they apply. So they get to sit there and say, who is our customer? If our customer are, 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 are sailors, then they can, they, can, they can choose a model which they think will best provide information that they believe sailors need, wind-related wind information, sea state-related information. If their customers are farmers, they're going to end up with a different set of parameters that, that, that drive what model they choose so that they can create the best product for people that are worried about hail, worried about drought, worried about high winds, worried about uh, uh, torrential rains that might flood out a, a crop. Um, they, or frost, for example, uh, in the case of fruit. Um, so so the, the models are adjusted, and they sometimes take multiple models and weigh them differently than the government does. The government gives you the plain vanilla version. It is somewhat uh, oriented towards maritime and, and aviation use, but, but basically speaking, the commercial vendors get a little bit of artistic license with it to fine tune the product. Usually, however, they produce similar results to government products, particularly in the short term. Because let's face it, they're dealing with the same observations and the models aren't that significantly divergent in the first few hours or even the first few days. But the advantages are better usability, so we have app-based uh, capability. We have the ability to download uh, a, a weather file and to keep it without having to have internet access so we can go back and, and refer to it. Um, and the, the idea that you can also integrate it with route planning tools. So you can integrate it into maps, moving map displays, chart plotters, and so on. And the ability to set custom thresholds for what you're interested in. Um, and the disadvantages are cost and bandwidth. So again, you pay for a better, better product. 
I have to tell you though, it's the same product, just repackaged uh, in most cases. So let's take a look at uh, some some, uh, some products. Uh, the simplest product is go to Boat US, and they'll provide you a essentially a reprint of the uh, uh, the marine weather forecast. And this is again the marine weather for Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Maurepas. It is the same language that you see in the government product. It's just that it's available on an app on your phone if you wanted to. And the font is better. And the font is better. That's right. I'll give it that. This is a product called WindHub. Uh, WindHub has um, an interesting set of uh, capabilities. One is you can simply, and I, these are screenshots off of my phone. Um, I, I use my phone for this, so a lot of people think that's crazy because it's a little screen, but I can put it in my pocket and don't have to worry about things. And it's the typical sort of touch screen thing. You can touch it and it, expand it and contract it with your fingers. And you can move the image around to find out uh, where you want to be, and you can tell it to center up on your uh, location. You have the ability to go to a menu and pull down what you want to see. In this case, I've wanted to see wind bars and fronts in my, uh, in my menu. Um, so I'm able to see that. And this is a wide area, and of course the bigger the area, this is New Orleans, that's Thunder Bay, and that's the Great Lakes up there. So right there is the, the height of the uh, central part of the United States. Um, what ends up happening is you obviously don't get wind barbs everywhere. You get them spaced where you can where you can see them. But if you excuse me, if you zoom in, here we have Mandeville, and we don't even see the southern part of uh, Lake Pontchartrain. We can see a group of wind barbs associated with the weather for that particular day. And again, in this case, the barbs are pointing toward where the wind is coming from. So the wind is out of the uh, southeast, and it looks like it's anywhere between uh, 10 knots to 15 knots. It's like 15 all the way down. But the point is, you get to see that. One of the things that you can do, though, is you can run this slider across on WindHub, and you can actually run it forward, I think, seven days. Again, your results may vary in terms of the accuracy of the forecast seven days out, but you do have the ability to go and take a look at it. And as you take a look at it, uh, you can compare it to what actually happens. And again, get that situational awareness about how the forecast is playing out. So that, again, when you're out on your boat, and you're seeing weather, you understand where it came from, where it's going, and what it's going to do. You can also take a look at other um, uh, aspects. For example, uh, you can take a look at uh, precipitation, and we have on the table on the far right-hand side of the screen, we have an example of a screenshot of precipitation uh, in the New Orleans area. Uh, you can see New Orleans and Hattiesburg uh, being represented there. Mandeville's the dot. Uh, so we're basically looking at Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne and uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the mouth of the river. And what you can see is, is at the location that I've selected, which is uh, Mandeville, from 4 p.m. through 12 a.m. on May 5th, or May 6th rather, to May 7th, you can see the change in wind direction that occurs, the change in wind speed in terms of the knots of wind, sustained wind, and the knots of gust. And you can also see the amount of precipitation in terms of millimeters for each of the hours in question. And you can also get a sense of the sea state in terms of the height of waves and the period between those waves on, on the area in question. So you can, you can actually see in a graphical or, or a, uh, a graphic of the precipitation and a table that tells you what's going on during the time period that you've selected. So it's a fairly interesting uh, uh, um, uh, product. One thing that's really nice is you can also do some route planning. You can plug in a route. This happens to be Mandeville to, uh, to New Orleans. It is not the route that I went, as I mentioned. Um, but what you can do is you can assign us an average speed. I just chose five knots out of just the idea of being you know, really kind of uh, uh, ambitious there. And uh, the route is uh, from, from essentially around M1 to the entrance to the harbor is uh, 19 nautical miles, should take three hours and 52 minutes. And if I tell it when I want to leave, in this case 9 a.m., it tells me what the wind is each of the hours as I make my way down. So in other words, the wind that is referred to at 10 a.m. is where I would be at 10 a.m. The wind at 11 a.m. is where I would be at 11 a.m. So it, it correlates the route, your speed, and the change in weather along that time frame 
uh, and gives you a text uh, a table that, that tells you what's going on. How reliable is that? Uh, I'm not really sure. I think that it's, um, it's probably reliable in open water. Uh, I think lake effect, unless, and I haven't seen a lot of lake effect uh, influence in these products, but my sense is that lake effect might, uh, might give you a trick uh, on a day that's relatively calm. This is a product called Sailflow. Um, Sailflow is actually kind of interesting because it has this uh, vi visual in which we see these streamlines of the wind, and actually in the actual app itself, these move. And so it gives you a real sense of the movement of the air. The other thing that it does is, is that um, it's also where the lines move faster the faster the wind moves. So that's kind of a, a nice visual representation. There's something kind of interesting about this though. The wind indicators are the arrows that show the direction the wind is going, as opposed to the barbs that point into where the wind is from. So you gotta kinda pay attention to how this is being portrayed. This is saying that the wind is coming from the south, from the south, from the south-southeast, over here in Slidell where they do things differently, it's coming out of the north, okay? Um, one of the other things you can do with sail flow is you can look at satellite photography, so you get some satellite imagery, and you can also go to individual locations like New Canal Station outside uh, Southern Yacht Club and you can see what the weather is at that location. Uh, so, or at least the wind is at that location. Sailflow is primarily a wind product. Uh, and it's, I, I like it and I think it's fairly, fairly intuitive. Um, one thing that is, um, it's worth looking into is, is, is radar, obviously dealing with thunderstorms and lines of weather and so on. There are a couple of uh, weather radar sources that uh, are, are, are at no cost and relatively easy to use um, and, and don't require, uh, yeah, that you can be done well, with an app uh, without any fee associated. One is my radar and the other is weather underground. Uh, these uh, systems simply use available weather radar. Most of it is government weather radar uh, and simply repackage it and, and publish it. Some of them have the ability for you to, um, uh, to, uh, to look at history of the weather so that you can see it coming toward you and get a sense of how fast it's moving and how, how severe it is. Um, uh, we see a, 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 a slider at the bottom of the weather underground image over there. This last product we're going to talk about is this thing called Luck Grib. So what is Grib? Well, Grib is, a, is an acronym for a gridded weather product. Basically what's happened is the meteorological world has come to a, a methodology of weather um, uh, forecasting which utilizes what is called a grid. Uh, in the United States, the grid is uh, on the order of, I think, 1.7 kilometers square, and the grid covers the entire United States. So imagine this. If we took a look at um, just the area around, uh, around New Orleans and uh, Lake Pontchartrain, uh, there's an airport at uh, New Orleans International, MSY. There's an airport at Lakefront. There's an airport at Slidell. There's one in Hammond. Each one of those airports have weather reporting, automated weather reporting, continuously. And that weather reporting would tell you what the weather is at those locations. Doesn't tell you anything about what the weather is in between the locations. Now, you could do a little interpolation, and you could do a little thinking about it, and might come up with what the weather is. But what the gridded products do is they take the weather observations across the United States, and then they do, through a set of models of both the terrain and the meteorological uh, uh, dynamics of the atmosphere, and the heating of the sun, and coverage by, by cloud cover, and so on, they go and do what is called an assessment of what the weather is in each one of those grid squares away from those reporting points. Then there's this thing called the RUC the Rapid Update Cycle Forecast. What the RUC does is it takes all those assessments for all of those 1.7 kilometer squares all across the United States, hundreds of thousands of them, okay? And it answers the question, what is the weather forecast for that grid point one minute from now? It takes that data and determines what the weather is one minute from then. And it does so for a 24 hour and a 48 hour forecast. It takes about 20 minutes for an oil cooled, 
Cray computer to do all the calculations. But it literally says, what do I expect the weather to be the next minute? And then once I know that, what do I expect it to be the next minute? And it does that for 48 hours, or tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of grid points. It's called the RUC, the Rapid Update Cycle Forecast, and it's uncannily accurate out to 48 hours. It's actually pretty cool stuff. Well, that grid uh, weather uh, concept has been used around the world and is being used by other weather organizations. The World Meteorological Association has identified a um, essentially a spreadsheet format for that gridded information, and that's called the GRIB. There's a company called Luck GRIB, and you pay an uh, actually it's a one-time fee for, for the rest of your life, so I hope I live long enough to make it up, uh, in which you can go and download on this little menu, you can download a weather file for a particular area of the world. And literally, you just find the area on the map, adjust it with your fingers, and, and whatever you see on your screen, that's the area you're going to get data for. You download the data, and then you click on this little button right here, and you choose what imagery you want to see. This is the Luck Grim uh, data uh, based on this particular model uh, of weather that was provided uh, on, on 5, 6, uh, uh, May 6th of 2023. And for that particular point, and I can move that point anywhere on this, on this screen, it tells me that the wind is 12.4 knots at 114 degrees, and it's expected to gust to 16.1. Again, that's an assessment or forecast of what the wind will be. I can move this slider down here at the bottom, and I can move it left and right and set different days. This is the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th of, uh, of May. And I, as I move it, I'll change the time, and I can adjust the time so I can do midnight or 6 a.m. or whatever time I want, and it will show me what the wind is. The color coding is uh, an indication of the knots of wind, the speed of wind, and as you can see, most of it is <coughs> excuse me, down here in the 5 to 10s, and then we get into this kind of a greenish yellow right here where we get to 15 knots. The second screen that's shown just to the right of that is uh, uh, a screen that, uh, again, is looking out to a larger area. We can see the, uh, the boot of Louisiana there. Uh, and basically what this does is allows a set of streamlines so you get to see where the, where the wind is blowing. And there's an interesting little uh, tidbit here. This little red line is where a parcel of air would be coming from to get to you and where it would go after it left you. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to uh, visualize the wind. The last image on the far right-hand side is actually off the coast of Thailand. I downloaded that, uh, uh, that uh, weather data, and sure enough, there's a bit of a typhoon there, and we can see winds uh, at the location that I've selected right here. The winds are 36 knots gusting to 49. Um, in the center there, we start seeing some of those pennants where we know that the wind is sustained at least at 50 knots. So uh, again, we can and the color coding also draws our attention to the, uh, uh, the level of wind. So we've covered a lot of products here. The last little bit that I want to talk about is decision making with weather. And this is a, 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 a something that's near and dear to me. I spent a lot of my time in my professional career uh, doing aircraft accident investigation. And uh, pilot decision making, maintenance decision making, dispatch decision making feeds into all of it. One of the things I'd like to offer to you is a kind of a an odd concept. Uh, Vicki says I ought, to, well, I ought to copyright this. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think it's a good idea uh, to just share it. We'll start by saying that data is not knowledge. We can get data from these apps. We can get data from the website. It'll tell us something. But it doesn't tell us anything unless we understand it. And so to understand it, we have to actually, we actually have to pay attention to, to, to learning something about weather so that when we hear somebody talk about a squall line, we know what that means. When we, when we see uh, falling pressures, when we know that a front is approaching, uh, we, we, we need to have some, some, some additional understanding in order to take that data and create knowledge. Knowledge is not insight. Insight is where we take various bits of knowledge and put them together and create an understanding that is not presented to us, that we synthesize in our brain that we create in our brain. But even after we do that, after we have an insight into what's going on, that's not wisdom. 
wisdom requires all three. It requires data, the knowledge to understand the data, and the insight that is gained from the various pieces of data and knowledge, all put together. That creates wisdom. And wisdom isn't something that can just be poured into your brain. It's something you have to accumulate with time. Understanding the data, being able to put it in perspective with knowledge, being able to make uh, reasonable insights, and then ultimately being able to apply it to decision making. Humans are subject to four kinds of basic errors. Now, I'm sure that there are psychiatrists and psychologists will go into greater detail. This is the quick and dirty way that, that people have used an accident investigation. People make four basic kinds of errors. They have sensory errors. They fail to sense something that triggers a correct behavior. So if you don't smell the, 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 the oil burning in your engine, you're not, going to know, you're not going to know that you've got an oil leak. In the weather context, if you don't hear or see the marine forecast that includes the small craft advisory, you will not be able to make a decision about whether the weather is good enough on the basis of that small craft advisory because you didn't see it. You didn't sense it. So sensory errors are, are one type. A second one is a memory error. We, we, we get a weather report. We, we, we take a look at Luck Grim or one of these products and we fail to remember something that we needed to remember at that time, like forgetting that the barb points toward the wind and going out the door thinking that the wind's going to be out of the northwest when in reality it's out of the southeast. At least it's forecast to be. A decision error is when we exercise poor judgment. And a good example of that in the weather world would be thinking that it's okay to sail when the wind is forecast beyond our skill level or beyond the ability of the boat. Uh, what sort of things drive decision errors? It's, it's a lack of understanding of the circumstances. It's a lack of assessment of risk and a lack of balancing uh, uh, the concepts of risk and reward. It's where we make choices to do things that may expose us to more risk than necessary. Now, I will tell you, I believe that sailing is an adventurous sport. It's a sport involving people continuously pushing the envelope. What I'll also tell you is, if you spend all your time outside of your envelope, you're going to get hurt. A little bit every once in a while under the right conditions, not so bad. It's good for growth. But you spend a lot of time there and you're just, you're alone for the ride, okay? So my, my, my thought there is that it, 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 in a decision error, we're really talking about exercising poor judgment. And a lot of that is about either not understanding what's going on, hearing that there's a squall line coming, but not understanding what that means, or hearing that a squall line is coming, understanding what it means, and saying, you know, I got a big boat and I've been doing this a long time, I can handle this, okay? And then there are action errors. Action errors are very simple. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a driver pressing the, the accelerator instead of the brake when they pull into a parking spot. Uh, we simply do the wrong thing. In, in, a, in an example here, it might be that we sense that there's going to be increasing weather. We remember that our boat needs to be reefed if it gets above uh, 15 knots, let's say. And, and we make a decision, yep, the weather's going to go above 15 knots. It's only 10 knots now. I'm going to make the decision to reef. That's a good idea. Get it done before you need to do it. And then we go out and do it, and we pull the wrong line. We pull the alcohol instead of the reef, and we start arguing with ourselves that the reefing system doesn't work. What do I do? What do I do? Hopefully somebody will say, hey, why don't you pull the other line? See what happens there. The point is, is an action error is a kind of error that humans make. Sensory, memory, decision, action. And i got to tell you, the one that gets us in trouble is this one, is a decision error. And it's where we choose to do something that we think is going to be okay when, in fact, it's not. And we do so because of influences. And we're going to talk a little bit about those. So in weather decision making, probably the first decision you have to make, the most basic decision that we have to make is this thing called the go, no-go decision. So go means we're going to choose to depart, and no-go means we're going to stay put. Pretty straightforward. Seems binary, doesn't it? Okay? And it is in, in the end result. The problem is, is that we don't make this decision in a vacuum. We don't make it only based on our ability, the boat's capability, our understanding of what the lake is like and various weather conditions, and our ability to read forecasts and weather reports. There are other things that affect the go-no-go -no -go decision, and they're real. They have tremendous impact on how we make those decisions. 
suppose that uh, you've got a family. Your spouse and children were going to go over to the Gulf Coast and visit some friends, maybe attend a little softball game over there, but you told them on Wednesday, the weather's going to be great on Saturday. The most important thing we can do as a family is get together on the boat and go sailing on Saturday. So they cancel their plans, they cancel the hotel reservation, they tell Aunt Gertie that they're not going to be coming, and they tell, you know, cousin so-and-so, we're not going to your softball game. Everybody weeps and moans, but everybody's happy to go sailing because, after all, we're all going to be doing it together. They sh you all show up at the dock about 9.30 in the morning, you're checking the weather. Yeah, I don't think this is a good idea. So now you've got to tell the family who's changed their plans, we're not going to go sailing today. Okay? There's pressure there. There's real pressure in that situation. You could be a racer, and you've got a crew that's scattered all over the place. You've got people in Lafayette, people in, in New Iberia, people over in Hammond. You've got people in Picayune, Mississippi. They're all coming to get on your boat because they like sailing with you. You're a good skipper. They really want to be there. They've all given up on other things. They have told their family members, no, I'm not going to be able to go with you out on such and such an outing. I'll make it up to you tomorrow when we have dinner together. We'll go out and have a nice brunch. And everybody goes, well, all right, you know, just this one time. And they all go off and go do it. They all show up at your dock, and you're sitting there looking at the weather thinking, I'm not sure this is a good idea. And you're going to have to make that decision. And your peers, suppose none of that's present. Suppose you sail on your own. You don't have a, a, an immediate family. You go out to your boat, you look up and down the dock. People say, hey, Hooper, what are you going to be doing today? Oh, well, I'm thinking about going on the, uh, on the cruise to New Orleans. Yeah, I'm going to go on the cruise. Uh, hold on, I'm going to go check the weather. I check the weather, come back out, and I'm, I'm not untying the boat. And all these other people are untying and unplugging and getting ready to go and got their motor running and getting everything warmed up. And Hey, are you going? Ah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to stay, stay put. Well, we're going. Come on with us. Well, you started down the decision not to go. And that's your decision. It's nobody else's decision. And now you've got all these people standing around you encouraging you to go. They don't mean to put you in harm's way. And if you pay attention to them exceptionally, in other words, that you, pay, you start being driven by them, you're no longer making those decisions. You're letting other people do it. And there's even self-esteem. You're sitting there in the, in the slip. You see your buddies leaving, or maybe they're just other people. You don't even know who they are. And you're saying to yourself, gosh, they're going out. I don't think I want to go. I, I think the weather's a little bit too rough. Now you're starting to doubt yourself. Maybe you're starting to think, well, maybe this isn't what I ought to be doing. Maybe, maybe, maybe they know something I don't know. Guess what? Maybe you know something they don't know. The deal is, all of these things have forces on you, influences on your go-no-go -no -go decision. The last one is a simple one. Suppose your boat's been, been worked on over at Seabrook Marine, and it's been worked on for a couple of weeks, and, and, and uh, uh, you've decided that on, on Sunday you're going to go over and go get the boat and bring it across the lake. You have a real job. You're going to be at work Monday through Friday, and Saturday next week you've got something going on with the family that you can't get out of. So basically it's either I'm going to move the boat today or it's going to stay here another week, and I'm going to pay slip fees for it. And so all of a sudden, 50 bucks or 75 bucks or whatever it is a day starts to add up, and you're thinking, i got to go. And for, what, 350, 400 bucks, you might make a decision to go when it's not safe. These things are real. They're absolutely real. And managing them requires a bit of maturity on the part of the sailor. Now, I'm going to offer something to you. It's an aviation axiom. This is from uh, uh, Frank Borman, the commander of Apollo 8. He made the statement that a superior pilot uses a superior judgment to avoid those situations that require the use of his superior <laughs> skill. Okay? A lot of superiors there and an awful lot of yeah, but. And it's not necessary that you push yourself to the end. And this is a test pilot. This is a guy who flew around the, uh, the moon in Apollo 8. I'd make the argument this applies to sailors just as well. So let's talk about the weather decision-making process. Supposing we are, we've, we've decided not to go. That's a pretty basic answer. We've made that decision. Um, I've canceled flights. I've canceled sailing uh, ventures. And when I've done so, I've always tried to second-guess myself by checking the weather the rest of the day. And that's good from an educational standpoint. It's good for, you know, for, for understanding how the weather actually played out. But don't do it for the purpose of trying to second-guess yourself. 
do it for the purpose of educating yourself about the decision. And maybe you'll make a better decision. You might be reinforcing the excellent decision that you made. When I was a corporate pilot at Lakefront Airport, uh, I was hired as a corporate pilot for a, a company called T. Smith & Son. Uh, I was, I think, 24 years old, which is pretty cool, you know, flying airplanes for a living at age 24. And um, the very first day, you probably remember this, Joe. He was in the FA at, uh, at New Orleans at this time. Uh, very first day of my employment as a pilot, I had a flight at 7 o'clock in the morning. I checked the weather, and I realized that while it would be possible for me to take off safely, if there was any malfunction in the aircraft, I could not return back to land safely. The weather was too low. So I called the owner of the company, and I canceled the flight. First day on the job, first flight assignment, I canceled it. The guy was good about it. He said, well, okay, you're, you're the pilot. You could tell in his voice, uh, okay, uh, we'll make other arrangements. And sure enough, they loaded up a bunch of people in a van and drove them to Vicksburg. It was a crew change on a tugboat. Later that morning, a Mitsubishi MU-2 twin-engine turboprop airplane was flying an approach to New Orleans Lake for an airport. They made three approaches that were unable to land. Running low on fuel, they made the last fourth approach and ducked under. And in doing so, crashed into the approach lights, the approach into the runway, and killed everybody on board the aircraft. That, of course, made the news. That evening, I got a phone call from the boss. This is all pre-email. I got a phone call from the boss, and his, his statement to me was, anytime you cancel a flight and anybody gives you any guff, you have them call me and I'll put them in their place. Wow. So it was a marvelous relationship. Unfortunately, people had to die for that to happen. The point of this is, when you make a decision, stick to it. Okay? Study it. Understand it. But, but don't waffle on it. Make the decision to either go or not go. If you make the decision not to go, hang it up and move on, learn from it. If you go, you're not done with weather decision making. You have to understand how the weather influences your voyage. What actions do you need to take? What equipment is going to be required? What's going to be your point of sale? Do we motor sail, break out the spinnaker, reef? What are we going to be doing? You may change your plans from what you expected to do earlier in the week on that Saturday morning based on what you now know about the weather. When do we need to do things? When do we want to depart or arrive? Is there a time window for some other decision to be made? If you're departing late and uh, you're wanting to get to the destination while it's still light, is there an alternate location that you can go into uh, during the day that you're going to make a decision, say at 3.30 in the afternoon, that we're either going to continue on to the destination or go to our, 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 our alternate destination? You, know, you need to understand that. The last question is who? Who needs to be on board? Do you need a specific person to help you with the foredeck? Do you need a specific person uh, who can help you uh, handle the boat uh, if the weather's going to be heavy? And also, who doesn't need to be on the boat? Is this a voyage that you don't need to have any small children? Is this a voyage that perhaps uh, you don't want an older person that might have issues with bones in case they, uh, they, they fall uh, or become dislodged on the boat and become injured? Uh, you may have some changes about who you want to be on the boat, both positively and negatively. The last thing I want to offer is, of all the weather sources of information, or sources of weather information, that are available to you, the most reliable are these two things in the front of your head. Okay? You will see the weather. You can smell it sometimes. You can feel it on your face. You can see the water, uh, the ripples in the water, the streaks in the water. You can see the clouds in the distance. You can see lightning. You can hear thunder. These are all indications of weather. And if you understand what's going on with the weather from the previous weather forecasts and, and following it during a couple of days prior to your voyage, whatever you see, hear, smell, is going to make sense. It'll make sense. It won't be, I wonder where that came from. So, I really do consider that to be the primary weather source as we're out on a boat, is what you see and what you hear, what you smell, what you feel. All the rest of this is just some nice stuff on an iPhone. This is where the real decisions are made. No matter how good the forecast was, if you see a thunderstorm, there is a thunderstorm there. Okay? The forecast does not trump the, uh, the actual 
the weather condition. We've got the weather information apps and uh, sites uh, available to you. Again, we've got the BBC shipping forecast if you want to go to sleep. Other than that, thank you very much for your attention. And are there any questions? Sir, ma'am. Just one word that you never used that is so huge, and there's so many examples of it being a problem. Okay. Scheduling. Yes. Schedules, I mean, you, you can all think of things where people felt pressured by a schedule. Ab absolutely. Um, can, can you give us some examples of that? And I agree with you in terms The worst for me is John Kennedy Jr. Yes. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he there. did not have to fly his airplane yeah. into the water. Yeah, the, uh, in, 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 and in boating, we, we see the same thing where, where we're trying to get to a location to, 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 to be prepared for a race in a day, uh, or, or we're participating in a cruise and we have a, a schedule to get to a location at a particular time. Um, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for putting up for me rambling on for a while. It's been a pleasure. Well, Hooper, I want to thank you for doing this. Weather, <laughs> weather's really one of the most important things that we have to deal with. If you're just going out on Lake Pontchartrain and you're two or three miles out and you can get back in, that's one thing. If you do one of the longer cruises that, are, that we're now doing, you're going to be out someplace where you can't come home right away. So this is something to think about. Hooper's given us all a whole basket of stuff to think about sources that are available but one of the most important things is the decision making thing that uh, process that you need to go through to say whether we get underway and go whether we turn around and come back you're talking about schedules uh, people who are smart cruisers don't follow a schedule because there are so many other things that preempt the schedule and the weather is the most important thing and so, Hooper, I thank you for doing this. Okay. I encourage all of you all to look at these things and review them and just let that be a part of your da daily existences. Look at the weather, what's it's going to be, and that sort of thing. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.